Good morning. Nice of you all to join us for our wonderful festival morning. Um, so for today, today's Bible study, uh, we will be talking about Matthew 22, 15 through 46. So we're going to complete the chapter 22 of Matthew today. So while you guys open up your Bibles to, again, Matthew 22, 15 through 46, I'm going to tell you guys a story. So when I was reading this text, preparing for this Bible study, uh, it made me really think back to when I was growing up to my father true Greek gentleman. Uh, he was very wise. He was someone that you really couldn't fool. And even though when I thought I might be getting away with something, you know, being the child that I was, um, I really wasn't. He always knew what was going on, even though when I thought I was getting away with it. And he always found out. And instead of saying like, hey, don't do that, or <laughs> uh, stop what you're doing, he would always, always used these formulated questions that he always knew the answer to. And I didn't notice that until like, I was older. And I was like, well, why don't you just say what you're going to say as opposed to, you know, why did you do that? Or these formulated questions. But the thing was is that he always asked the right question. And he would ask them to essentially trap me into, not necessarily trap me for the lack of a better word, but so that I, through this questioning process, would learn the right way to go. And obviously, once when I was inevitably chapped, he would always take that time to, for the teaching moment, like I'm saying. So when I got older, and older I was, I thought that I had the same type of skill, the set that he did. You know, he's my father, so obviously I got half of, half of him. So I thought maybe I might have the skill set. So I would ask him questions to try to trap him, and he always had the right answer. And that's just what happens when you're dealing with someone who's older than you. They're wiser. They're always going to be wiser, and they'll always know what is the best. And that's something that's almost lost in our generation, but that's a whole other discussion for later. And so when I think about this, it, it really reminded me when I was reading this passage. And we see in this passage that we have the Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, and they think that they're smart enough to trap Jesus with all these questions but as we will see when we read it, that they can't. The he, he's too wise for them. So not only does he just have the answers, but we will also see that he also has the right question. And when one of the most important things about studying the Bible is knowing who the audience is. No, you know, I'm speaking to you all. I know that this is the St. Demetrius community of Fort Lauderdale. You know, I know who you are, you know who I am. There's this connection in between us because we know each other. Well, for us to understand what Jesus is saying, someone who we might have a connection to, you know, we need to know who the Pharisees were, who the Sadducees were, what their roles within society were. So on the Bible study, if you guys have received it from the Narthex, we're just going to go over quickly, you know, who the Pharisees were, who the Sadducees were. So we have the Pharisees. They were a sect within Judaism that were called to follow the law strictly. They were, they were interp as they interpreted it though. They were seen as lawyers. They were uh, lay teachers of the law in the synagogues. And throughout the Bible, you'll see them being called scribes and lawyers. Uh, then we have the Sadducees. Their high social status was reinforced by their priestly responsibilities. So we're talking about rabbis, we're talking about teachers, we're talking about the high priests. And this was mandated within the Torah. So this whole social status that they had was mandated between them. And as you see in our Bible passage today, they also do not believe of a resurrection. So uh, they didn't have the same type of beliefs. So them and the Pharisees are one of the two major ones. And they were usually in opposition with each other. Very rarely were they together in agreement. And when it comes to these questionings, you'll see that some of these groups start coming together. All right? Then the third one, we have the Herodians, which were a Jewish sect that were in close relation to King Herod and were allies or seen as allies with the Pharisees. Uh, they are not as large as the other two. There's, as with all religions and denominations, there's all these smaller denominations. And so this is, imagine just one of those. 
And uh, while these questions were being asked to trap Jesus, they were there as witnesses to this in conjunction with the Pharisees. So now that we know who our audience is, we're going to go through part by part. So again, we're talking about Matthew 22, uh, verse 15 to 46. But we're going to go from section to section. So the first section is where the Pharisees are asking this question about being lawful to paying taxes. So let's read it together. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said to them, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me, the ta- show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the thing that are God's. And they had heard these words, and they marveled, and they left them on their way. So, as did many of the people in the area, and the whole empire for that matter, they did not really like that they had to pay all these taxes. And to give you an idea, they were actually taxed more than what were taxed. I mean, they had three, four different taxes. There was an income tax, just like how we have. There is a ground tax, which was one-tenth and one-fifth of the oil and wine of their properties. And then there was a poll tax. Being able to walk around and being able to travel, they had a tax. So they essentially had a tax for existing and being humans, which is kind of ridiculous, but these were the taxes of those ages. So the reason why they were asking this question about paying the taxes is this was something that they really believed that they shouldn't have. But they know if he said a certain answer, they could do something. And if he answered the other way, there was a replication for that. But he didn't answer the right way. So let's go through it. So let's look at the possible answers. Jesus could have said that it was unlawful to pay the tax. Then the Pharisees would promptly report him to the Roman Empire, and he would eventually be thrown in jail. Two, he could have said that it was lawful to pay the tax, and more than likely he would have been discredited, and he would have become less popular among the people that were believing in him. So... they would pay the tax and stand discredited to many of the people of this conversation because, again, they resented all the taxes. And they were put on them for two reasons. Obviously, it affected them financially, but two, because for religious reasons. Jews, God was their only king, and their nation was making them pay a tax to an earthly king, an earthly emperor, and they had to admit this validity to this earthly emperor, which for them was putting them in a sticky situation because they felt as if they were denouncing God insulting God, rather. So, either way, Jesus would be wrong, because with this hand, he would be thrown in jail, and with this hand, all the people that surround him would discredit him and think that his popularity would go down. So, either way, it's kind of a trap, right? But Jesus, of course, was wiser. He got out of this trap, and he has to see that coin, and to show whose image is on the coin, because who it belongs to in regards to their rules and regulations. But Jesus never laid down his own regulations because his teaching is timeless. It's a timeless teaching. And emperors are not because they eventually, they pass away and that's it, their reign ends. So this teaching that every Christian is almost a double citizenship almost. They have, he's a citizen of the country. We're all citizens of the United States or Greece for that matter and he is a citizen of the country which he lives in, and he gives to it the public services, the taxes, the community services, and so on. But he's also a true citizen of heaven. So you're looking at this twofold citizenship. Because we as humans are just like the coin. We have our image, and we were created in God's image and likeness. So again, when you give to Caesar what is Caesar's, we gotta give to God what is God's, and that's us. So, again, we're created in God's image and likeness, and our image, God's image, is impressed onto all of us uniquely in some way, shape, or form. So these are the things we've got to keep in mind. So for the next one, 
We have the Sadducees. So again, these are the people that do not necessarily believe in a resurrection. So I'll read along. And this is verse 23. The same day the Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher Moses said if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up his offspring for his brother. Now they were with seven brothers. His brother shall marry his wife and raise up his offspring for his brother. Now there are with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even all the way to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven shall she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what is spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So, to give you a little bit of background on this whole marriage situation, uh, which was a hypothetical situation that the Sadducees had created to kind of trap Jesus, uh, they had this thing called levirate marriage. And what levirate marriage is, is exactly what you heard, it is the rule about if the woman has no children, it is the duty of the husband's brother, if the husband passes away, to marry her and bear children with her. So in this hypo hypothetical situation, they go down this whole lineage of seven brothers, and they, and, and they ask, well, when we go to heaven, who's wife shall she be? All seven brothers were technically her husband. So, again, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, and with this, they tried to trap him to, to figure out this doctrine, to show them that, you know, they're right. They tried to trap him so that they said that the Sadducees are right. Well, Jesus had a, a really good answer, and their interpretation of the resurrection in our heavenly kingdom are wrong because they're ignorant of the scriptures, as we read. And they say nothing about this earthly laws, these levirate marriage and so on, are heavenly laws. It's a, you have to think about it in separate entities. So the resurrection is not necessarily uh, a continuation of life. You know, it's not like, oh, we're just going to continuously grow and grow older and older and older. It, there's a... It, it's not like that. It's not where we're resuming where it left off. It's a complete change of life. So let's look at this trap that they had tried to create. So they said that there's no text in the Pentateuch, which is the five books, that could prove a resurrection of the dead. Well, here's Jesus' knockout punch for the whole thing. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, all of these are dead men. The living God cannot be the God of dead men. The living God must be the God of a living man. So with that, the whole argument about the resurrection that the Sadducees had were completely shattered. Like just imagine being completely shattered. Their whole belief system and doctrines that they tried to create completely gone with that one statement. He showed them that their scripture actually does show them that there is a resurrection and that it must not be thought of in earthly terms, in time, contained in time or space. So we'll go to the third one, where the scribes, meaning that this is where you'll have the Pharisees and Herodians together, and speaking about the first commandment, which one is the one? So we'll read along. This is now verse 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of, in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, like we said before, the Pharisees are experts. They're lawyers, they're scribes. They're experts on the scripture and of the law. So through this whole process, they calculated 613 commandments. So that, there's a lot of commandments to be, 
to distinguish which one of these is the greatest. So once the Pharisees heard that, this, that Jesus sh shattered the whole Sadducean argument about resurrection, they thought, hmm, maybe since we talk about this constantly, about which one of the 613 commandments there are is the greatest, maybe we'll ask him and see what he says, since he completely shattered the argument of the Sadducees. So Jesus replies with a definition of what our faith is as Orthodox Christians. He describes to us what Christianity is about, and that is we're here to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and the second being to love thy neighbor as yourself. So all of us all together. And we hear this and we see how powerful that is. And he sums up our whole faith in just those two statements, those two commandments. That's, that's what Christianity is about. That's why we're here. We're loving our Lord with all our heart, but we're also loving each other, especially when it comes to this whole festival. Not only are we loving just the St. Demetrius community, but we're loving the whole Fort Lauderdale community, sharing with them our wonderful faith and sharing them the culture that we have. So let's move on to the last section. Jesus, how, can, how did David call his descendant Lord? So this is where Jesus kind of takes the offensive, and he, he asks the questions now. Now all these people are done. They, he's at, they've exhausted all their questions. He's answered every single one of them, but now it's his turn. So this starts from verse 41 to 46. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. Well, he replied, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him, not a word, nor from that day did anyone ask him any question to him anymore. So they're pretty much done. <laughs> they're pretty much trying to get to trap him because not only is he completely annihilating arguments that they had about the 613 commandments, completely annihilating arguments about the, the resurrection and the, the beliefs of resurrection. Now he's talking about this offensive, how David can be called the son. So now the table has turned, and this is where Jesus takes the offensive by asking them a question, and he asks them a question to expose them because they, they think that they know everything. And sometimes we always think that we know everything. But sometimes we have those moments where we might not just know everything. And this is one of those cases. So they supposed that the Messiah was just going to be a mere man. And therefore replied, the son of David. That was their response to Jesus when he asked the question. Was the son of David. And he knew they were going to go that route. So he was wise about it. So he asked them in a reply, well, why does the son of David reply to him as my Lord? How can his son be his Lord. So wouldn't they be referring to God? So he lands them in this trap, and then he takes the time to teach them the truth faith, the two drachen, how they do not know everything that they might think they know, and of course, from that point on, they stopped asking questions. So when we look back at all these four questions, or this four series of questions back and forth between Jesus and the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians, we think about how still relevant they are today. You know, how much should one give to his own, or his or her own country? What about the fear and death in afterlife? You know, it scares us very much. The death is something that we like to kind of suppress because it scares us, and it's something that you know maybe if we speak about more, then we, you know we'll be able to kind of have find more comfort in it because of the resurrection. Well, the third question being, well, what is my religion about? As we heard, we heard the two commandments. And what are the, and even more so, what are the minimal demands? You know, some people are like, oh, well, you know, I might not be able to make church on Sunday, but, you know, I pray at home, I do this, I do that. Well, follow the two commandments, and we can ask you of that. But through those two commandments, it also includes worship. And four, how do we know God better? Is, is he truly the Messiah? So these are four very timely questions. And all of this shows is the power of a question and how this one, that one question mark actually has a very large responsibility. So when we ask questions, we need to think about the right questions. And questions can be tools that actually help us. They can help us build a strong foundation, but at the same time, they can also be like bulldozers knocking us down. And we ask questions to learn more about our faith, 
to learn more about our brothers and sisters that are around us, getting to know each other. You, I remember when you meet your best friends, you always ask questions about one another, get to know each other better. So these are ways that we can use questions as tools to build us up. And like I was saying, think about how many times we ask questions and it's almost like as if it's a bulldozer bringing us down. So think about it. How many of us look to God for answers? When we pray, we look to God for answers. You know, we're trying to look, we ask questions, and sometimes we might not get the answer we want. So how many of us have asked the Lord, Lord, what is wrong with me? God, what did I do to deserve this? We, sometimes we question the most when, you know, things are, we're dealing with struggles. You know, when things are happening within our lives, whether it's with family members or whether it's our own selves. So we all have done that. And as, we, as soon as we ask these questions, our brains start to work trying to think of these answers and trying to think of why could these things possibly be happening to us. And these answers have a way of reinforcing our doubts because we're thinking, maybe God's doing this. But he's not. It's not his fault. It's not our fault. It's just something that we're dealing with. And for example, if we ask, you know, what did I do to deserve this? We're assuming that we did something, that it's, again, that it's our fault, that our actions were the result, and this was the result, this was the consequence for that. But maybe is it because I sinned? No. Is is it maybe because it's a bad person? No. These questions suppose that we had control of the whole situation, and that's the issue. We think that we have control of these situations. So when we ask these questions, we're presupposing that we have our hand within this somehow having an effect in it. But... It's not us. It's not us at all. We do not have the control. God has the control. But that doesn't mean we go and question God. Do we question God when uh, we're happy and we're joyful and everything's right in the world and we're having a good time? Are we saying, are we there questioning God? No, absolutely not. But sometimes in time of struggle, it's the first thing we do. And the problem is that we're asking the wrong questions. And we should be looking to God for, instead of trying to point the blame and try to figure out who's the, what the issue is, we should be looking for strength, for comfort, for forgiveness. And only then will you really kind of see these answers, and these answers will appear to, our, appear to ourselves. So my challenge, I always end everything with a challenge. And so my challenge to all of you is to ask the right questions, to know when the time is, is to ask the right questions. As we, see, as we saw in all of our passages, all those excerpts, the right que- there were wrong questions, and then there was a right, a right question. So, again, the challenge, ask the right questions and let your questions be tools that build you up as opposed to the bulldozers that break you down. Thank you.